Okay, let's start. Um, this is Tom, and uh, he's going to tell us also an interesting story of GCP. Tom, the stage is yours. Enjoy. Hello. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm going to try and not keep everyone for too long. I understand it's Saturday and there's beer being promised, so I'll try and get through this as quick as I can. Um, so I want to give a talk around um, the, the company I work for, a company called Holiday Extras, and there's a couple of us around here today. Um, and it's kind of a journey that we've been on in the last year. Um, we've moved away from a, a monolith that is um, a giant PHP monolith that we've been, we were using. And over the last year, we've moved to a, a Node.js microservice architecture. Um, we've built a lot of tooling to help that and help our developers on that journey. Um, and a lot of those pieces of tooling uh, come from the GCP platform. Um, but I want to talk about how we kind of took that and how we, um, how we allowed our engineers to move very quickly. Um, so before I do that, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name's Tom. Um, I'm a software engineer at Holly Extras. I've been there for about two years now, two and a half years. Um, and currently, I'm working in the confirmations team. Um, we were a pod that was spun up in the last year or so, and we're using microservices to solve um, a lot of the, uh, email problems we have. Cool. Um, so a small bit of history, as I kind of said at the beginning. Um, sort of in the last sort of year, year and a half, we've moved away from a PHP monolith, um, and we're moving towards Node.js as our primary stack. Uh, um, but I want to make it clear that this talk is kind of specific around our journey, but the tooling that we've taken and the processes we put in place isn't unique to us as a company. These are things that can be taken on by anyone who's interested. Uh, so then the first thing that we really made sure that we wanted to do was we wanted to offer our engineers tooling at all stages of the development process, um, whether that be starting from scratch with an empty file or to debugging a uh, production running service. Um, the processes we put in place um, sort of removed our core teams from the processes, sort of the deployment processes, and it allowed them to really focus on just building great applications that allowed our customers to, to operate and use our systems. Um, it does remove some of the freedoms that some of our, the more senior teams really enjoyed, but we've really um, helped junior engineers get up and running on our platform really quickly. Um, I should probably define this word. So Dockyard is a, an internal code name that we use for everything that runs on our microservice platform. Um, it's kind of a Mickey take of Docker and then like a shipyard. Um, but we use it as a code name for everything. And it's kind of dotted a few times around this, this talk. So I thought I'd define it early. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get started. So if we, we look back where we were a year ago, um, if we wanted to create something new and run it in production, um, it usually took about two weeks from concept to actually having something that was running. Um, and this for us just wasn't scalable, the amount of the rate we wanted to push code, code out. Um, it also involved a lot of people from different teams. We had to get infrastructure involved to provision hardware, IT to set up DNS and security, um, security layers for us. And it also just involved engineers writing the code. And the problem was, when we first started um, down this route a year ago, everyone was doing it differently. We had different teams uh, running on AWS, some teams running on Google, different configurations and different stacks, and it got really complicated for us to manage. Um, so we, we decided to tackle this problem through tooling, and I want to kind of walk through how we solved the creating a service step. So we created a tool to start with called Dockyard Create, um, and basically this is a command line tool that our engineers can run, and it goes off and does some uh, pretty magic stuff for us. Um, so the first thing it does is it creates all of our GitHub repositories, um, and they're all set up with the correct user permissions and the correct access groups. Um, it creates all of our CI deployment pipelines. Um, it creates a staging and production environment that's hosted on GCP, uh, in Kubernetes and GCP. Um, essentially, it does all of this stuff. Uh, it creates Hello World templates for us, all of our alerting, logging, database provisioning, and caching. Um, something that I want to talk about a lot later is our chat ops integrations. So all of this is done, and it all happens in less than five minutes. So something that took us two weeks, we've now moved to something in under five minutes. And the power of like, the cloud has really helped us do this. Like we're not, and the APIs that Google have available have really helped us get this down. Um, the next problem that we, kind of had, we faced when we moved to this process was that engineers and testers still wanted to be able to run this on their laptops. Um, but obviously, we had the problem that our services are talking to multiple services, and like, how do you emulate that? So we, we created another tool called Dockyard Local. Um, Docker Local essentially spins up um, a Docker container locally for every service that your service is dependent on, and basically runs some Docker Compose commands, and it emulates that environment for you. This is 
it works. It's, it's a little bit difficult running on Macs, Docker for Macs, an interesting piece of software. It's not as good as it could probably be, but it works. It does work for us. Um, but at the moment, we're moving to more testing and staging environments. Um, yeah, so it runs all the services that you are independent on. So how do we get this tooling out? So we've built this great tool, and it does some really cool stuff for us. But we have uh, over 100 engineers. How do we get all of these engineers using it? Um, yes, yeah, so we have 100 engineers. They all have the same tools, and they all need to use them. Um, that's. Uh, I'll come back. Yeah, so, so 100 engineers all need the same tooling. Um, they, have, they all need to be kept up to date. Um, yeah, so we basically ship this node toolbox thing in your, GitHub, in your package JSONs when you start, which is our sort of core tooling platform. Um, and to do it, we kind of we use NPM. We ship system uh, tooling out using NPM. All our engineers know how to use it. Uh, it's really useful for us. So essentially, if you want to use the Dockyard tooling, you just run NPM install from GitHub. Um, your, the tooling's available on your machine. Um, the real advantage we have here is that NPM allows you to ship binaries. So we can ship the, the binary command straight into your, onto your laptop as a global, global executable, and then it's done. Um, so the, the key takeaway from us from this process that we went through was that automation creates consistency and eases development for our engineers. We now know that when you create a service, we know exactly what it's going to look like. And when we switch teams, you know what you're going into, and you know that the, the foundations of everything you're going to be working on is similar. Um, so what's next? I can, I've built a service, and it's up and running. Um, but how do I start writing my code, and how do we aid developers through that process? We know that all services need some core, some core principles and some core pieces of tech. Um, so for example, every service needs metrics, logging. We need to be able to debug it. And there's different steps throughout that lifecycle method. Um, so logging, um, we had some engineers doing this, some engineers doing this, some doing this. And as you can see, they're all different. Um, we needed to solve that problem. We had the same problem with database and caching. So an example of that is we had three different teams that took a week to develop their own database integrations for our services. Um, and essentially, two of those weeks were wasted. We, could have, we should have grouped up at the earlier, decided on a common format, and gone with that. So out of this process, the Node Toolbox was born. Sorry. So yeah, the Node Toolbox was born. <clears throat> the Node Toolbox was born. Um, so the Node Toolbox ships with every service that we create, and it offers some um, some common tooling that we want that every engineer can follow and can use. So example, we have caching, and that's what we ha all our engineers have to do. Um, uh, right now, we use Redis, but the advantage of this abstraction layer is that we can switch out our caching principles behind the scenes without engineers really needing to know. Um, we create the database abstractions as well, so that we now don't have that three, like every team's not creating their own, spending a week creating their own installations. Um, so some other things that we use, we, we have a couple of different ways that we allow services to talk to each other. Um, one of them is RPC. Um, you can create, a re you register commands and you request commands. Um, under the hood, this is used the gRPC module from Google, I believe it's from Google originally, um, which has been really great for us. It's allowed us to set up a lot of um, firewall protections around who and who can't talk to each other. Um, yeah. And so we also use PubSub. Uh, so PubSub is another real um, that we use a lot at our holiday extras now. Um, we use Google PubSub for this. Um, but there's a big section on that later, so I'll come back to how we really use it as a company. Um, so the next step that we had was like, well, I've written some code now and it's working, but it's not working as optimally as I'd like. So we, I want to change the resources of my project. Um, as we kind of saw earlier, like with the app.yaml files in, GR, in for like Compute Engine, um, we've got, done something very similar. And essentially, we've just aliased it away from being in a YAML file to something that our like JavaScript engineers are probably more familiar with. Um, so essentially, inside the package JSON for our Node.js app. Um, We've essentially just mirrored what um, was in the YAML files, but we can set our scaling routes, our memory and CPU. Um, and then we've set, um, we can set this for each environment. So there's a development, there's staging, review, and production environments. And you can set them all uniquely. Um, so here, like our CPU target is basically saying that when I hit 75% of my CPU, switch like, my scaling up. Um, so this, the real process and benefits that we found here was that abstraction removes the complexity for engineers. We don't have to spend weeks whiteboarding solutions. 
Um, we now know that when I pick up an app, I can get started pretty quickly. I can get running with sort of the core things I need to build without bike shedding for days. Um, so it's built. We have something that's running, um, and it's doing its job. But what's next? Um, so as I don't know how many people use Node.js. Um, we end up with a lot of dependencies. Um, and keeping those, in, keeping those up to date is really difficult. So up to, up, as of, I think, yesterday, we were running up 200 uh, microservices now in production. Um, if each of those have 10 dependencies, we have 2,000 dependencies to try and keep up to date. Um, this just isn't practical if to do manually. Um, so we created um, RenovateBot. Um, there's kind of other things out there. I think there's GreenKeeper, which does something very similar. But essentially, this, uh, this goes through our GitHub repos. It finds our dependencies, and it auto-merges um, pull requests in for us. Um, we've recently rolled C CD, so continuous development, uh, deployment. So some of these are um, so for patch and minor updates, we auto-merge them straight through. Um, but for mages, we still leave um, pull requests in for developers to manage. Oh, where are we going? That one's right. Um, so the next thing is that we have to deploy our code. So um, CI is very expensive for us at scale. Um, it's really good. There's some really great offerings out there. But um, we moved away from things like Travis and Circle in the last couple of weeks. Um, the problem we had that builds weren't quick enough um, they were taking quite a long time. There was a lot of boilerplate stuff that we had to get up and running. Um, developers were waiting in queues. So the amount we ship, we had builds probably up to 150 builds running on CI a day. Um, and that's quite expensive, and capacity starts to get lost. Um, so we did something quite radical, and we built our own CI deployment pipelines. Um, we, moved, we, did, we chose not to use things like um, Jenkins, and we ended up going our own route. Um, and we've kind of really seen the benefits of that. Like, it was quite a radical choice, and there was a lot of discussions around it at the time. But um, this is our CI. It's our internal CI tooling that we built. Um, and all of this runs on Kubernetes as well and on the GCP platform. Um, so we have our builds that are running. We know what's going. We have uh, logging output uh, for all of our unit tests. And we also uh, run all of our Selenium grids. Um, in or we built them in-house, but they run on the compute engines. Um, which is really good for us. Like they scale out as much as we need them to be. So if we're running 50 builds at once, it doesn't really matter. They can all run and don't interfere with each other. Um, so the other thing that happens in production is that we all know stuff goes wrong. So what, what do we do? Um, what do we used to do? Um, so what we used to have was this. People would call our call center. We'd be told that something was wrong. Engineers would rush around a table and try and replicate that issue, um, which never works. Like, there's always some obscure things that someone's doing in online that we just don't know about. Um, we then try and identify which part of our system was at fault. I mean, in a PHP project with some files at like 2,000 lines of code, that's not, that's not the easiest thing to do. Um, so yeah, so as I said earlier, like our, now our services ship with nice logging integrations. Um, we use two logging platforms. Um, right now, we use Sumo Logic for most of our engineering roles. But um, more of our data teams are pushing towards Stackdriver. Um, as I said as well, they all ship with metrics. Um, we use Prometheus and, Graf Prometheus and Grafana to build um, nice metrics dashboards for us. Um, we also have um, great integrations with Slack. So we have alerts that come out of Grafana, and they push straight into our Slack integration, um, which I'm going to kind of talk about, because for me, this is one of my favorite things we've built. And I think it's really great to see um, what our engineering team have done here. So Slack at Holiday Extras um, is used by everyone every single day. So all of our communication is done with Slack. We're a remote company. Um, so we have, we have developers out here in Bulgaria. We have developers all around the UK. So it's really important for us to keep everything in one place. Um, most teams have sort of three Slack channels. Um, we have our public-facing channel, where stakeholders and other engineers can sort of come and talk to that team. We have the private channel, which is essentially for GIFs and memes. There is nothing practical going on in those channels. Um, and then we have our acknowledgment channel. Um, and this is essentially a place that all of the bots that we have at Holiday Extras come and talk in one place. Um, so as I said, we, um, we built our chat ops integration, essentially. So chat ops and real-time notifications are really beneficial to us. So as I said um, earlier, we have alerts that come out of uh, Grafana. Um, so that we get these real-time reports in that channel. Um, we can see when it happened, when it was resolved. 
um, and what the impact on our graphs were. Um, as I said, we also built our own CI, so we have a CI bot that basically talks you through everything that's happened, uh, and it, slap, it threadifies each step of the build process. Um, so this is really useful. As you can see, there's a redeploy button on the right-hand side. Uh, so this build failed, right? I, this redeploy button allows me to rerun that build. But the benefit of this is, as you saw on this one, this build was successful. Like, this was green. So the worst case scenario is if we get alerts that are firing, saying like stuff's broken in production, I now don't need to be in the office to solve that. I can be sat on a train on my phone. I can scroll quickly back through Slack and redeploy a last successful build, and everything's good again. Like I don't need to worry about getting up on at midnight on a Sunday morning to start deploying stuff. Uh, yeah. um, so we had some other oddities and some weird things that we um, we kind of had to tackle in the last year. Um, mainly around our GitHub usage, our privacy, and, our, and GDPR laws. Um, we have lots of services which ultimately come with lots of secrets and lots of passwords that we don't want publicly accessible, or we, do, we kind of want to lock within teams. An example of that is we have a, our in-house payment team that work with third parties to integrate sort of payment solutions, and we kind of want to keep that away. We kind of keep it at a minimum, like if you don't need to know about it, it works for you, you can use the payment APIs, but you don't need to know the underworkings of it. Um, and we kind of have some reasons of this. So we essentially locked GitHub down. It's a, it's a break internally, so we basically access groups. So when you create a service, a team will own that service, and only that team can see the code in GitHub. Um, this isn't something that was necessarily the most popular choice. Um, it was a very heated discussion for a long time. But the, the, essentially, the output is that once engineers stop putting passwords in their code, we'll stop locking it down. Um, we have a lot of them that are still around as legacy projects that ultimately will take a long time to remove them from. But um, right now, it's the best option we had. We had to, to, for GDPR reasons, this was enforced upon some decisions that were made. Um, but to get around that, like, we tried to make this as easy for developers to deal with as possible. Um, we created another bot called Access Bot. So you can drop into a public channel on Slack of anyone else. You can drop this in, and it will essentially, uh, if granted by that team, will give you 24-hour access into their, their sections of GitHub, which means that we, we're still allowing engineers to talk and use each other's code, but we're, we're kind of monitoring that access. Uh, so this is the next part that I really want to talk about, and this is our big usage of um, PubSub and BigQuery and all of the awesome Google tech we've heard about today. Um, so our Holonetris, we call it the data platform. So the data platform is, that is used by everyone at Holiday Extras, um, myself included. So my full, my full system runs off the data platform. Um, it's a set of JSON schema um, rules that basically look like our, what our events and messages should look like. Um, and we can basically publish them to get to the data platform. Um, and then they run through Google's PubSub architecture, and then we have services that subscribe to those. Um, and this allows us to basically push messages from throughout systems and allow those systems to talk to each other. Um, and the, the next part, I realize I have rushed through these slides significantly. So I'm going to try, I might jump back through some other parts and go into some more detail on them if everyone's okay with everyone. Um, we have, we have to use BigQuery as our main data analytics platform now. We're moving away from um, some, some old legacy like Redshift architectures um, and IBM systems that we use. Um, so every message that is emitted by a team onto the PubSub system is pushed to BigQuery. We can then like, go through those and understand what's going on. And we have a lot of engineers now making use of things like Data Studio. And we create our own reports um, so that we can understand what's going on in our systems for tracking, um, et cetera. Um, so the next big thing that we obviously took away from this is that automation, abstraction, and acknowledgments are really important. Um, allowing engineers to get up and running really quickly um, through the automation processes I spoke about is brilliant. We can now run stuff very quickly. Um, the abstraction allows us to move quickly and not bike shed which node module to use for like MySQL connections, but ultimately we want to connect to a MySQL database. We're not, the end goal is always the same. And acknowledgements allow our engineers to understand what's happening with their products and understand what's going on. Um, so I realize I moved quickly. So there's a few parts I'd really like to go back, like I've got a fair amount of time left, and kind of go through, through these in a bit more detail. Um, if we go back to kind of... If 
we go back to... So our create process is really interesting. So, so all of this stuff that we create um, for you in less than five minutes, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of Google tech that goes on behind the scenes here that is kind of, it's hard to explain. <laughs> but essentially, um, we... How do I explain it? So our production and staging environments, for example, they're all built um, in, and pushed into Kubernetes, and we have meshes on top of that that allow them to talk. Um, the alerting and logging dashboards are really useful. Um, as I've said so far, like, alerting is vital, and the logging is really important. Database is optional, so we, can, we allow engineers to pick and choose during their create step what they want to have. Um, and the abstractions that we've put in place are great. So right now, we, we're hitting a lot of problems that MySQL is costing us a lot of money. To run MySQL instances in production isn't necessarily cheap, uh, especially when we have a lot of... Most of our engineers are essentially doing CRUD-based applications that MySQL is necessarily kind of maybe a bit of an overkill for. So we're looking to move to a, um, an offering from Google, which will be the... Oh, it's one of the, it's one of the uh, relational databases that Google offer. I can't remember the exact name. Um, and once we do that, it should be a lot better. We move to document stores rather than uh, MySQL. And that basically allows us to... Uh, the abstraction layers basically mean that we don't care. Like, engineers don't ever have to change. As long as we keep our abstractions unique enough that... Uh, sorry, abstracted enough that running database.query still returns the same results, our engineering teams can move without this really being a problem. Um, I'd also probably notice we, we've... We do a lot of this without engineers knowing, so, and without the business really knowing. So we've we replaced full services and have stripped stuff out of our monoliths and replaced it completely into the microservice platform with no one knowing. So we have a key part of our system, which is for availability. So we sell car parks for airports. And we get that availability from a particular endpoint in our API. And we completely moved that out and moved, removed it without anyone really noticing, um, which I think is a great success for this kind of architecture. And we can delete and move stuff, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, some of the other stuff that we do um, around uh, PubSub, um, we, we have um, some very legacy systems. Um, so we have something that, was, that still runs pretty much a lot of our core business um, that was written in BASIC um, a very, very long time ago, about 30 or 40 years ago now. Um, and we've actually managed to coax that into this sort of data-driven pipeline. So we use it, and it pushes events up for us. That means we can start to abstract those models away. So I think um, something that I'd really take away from this, and something that we've definitely learned, is that using data-driven development um, is really beneficial. Um, it allows you to, as soon as you can move your, decouple your data from your code, it means that you can replace those pieces without really, without the overall architecture of your systems changing. Um, I'm going to kind of end it there. I hope that's okay with everyone. If there's any questions. Um, I'm more than happy to spend time asking this stuff, but I do also have to rush off after. Unfortunately, I won't be around for the but... <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. So uh, Tom is a cheater. He's rushing off, and so we have to ask him all the questions that we need now. So please do, so I do, and uh, then it's uh, GG Sofia Eshko. My um, my Twitter handle is on the um, slides as well. So if anyone has any questions, it's Tom Vance ninety four. It's up. It should be up there. So and they'll share them around. Sure. So we have a couple of questions already recorded in the side of one after the other. Let's see how, where we get that. So the first one is, what do you really think about PHP? What are the pros and cons against Node.js? I should make a disclaimer. This kind of a question is fine -ish because it's not that aggressive. <laughs> so it can go. No, it's fine. I'm happy to answer this one. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm a, I'm a big fan of PHP. <laughs> um, I, it's quite an odd one. So I worked uh, for like three years as a PHP developer, a web agency. Um, I kind of agree with um, the guy earlier. So I can't remember, Bar Baraslov? Baraslov? The guy from earlier who had the PHP questions. Um, I think it's the best tool for the job. Like you pick which tool you want. Um, if you think PHP works really well for you, go and use PHP. We're currently Dockerizing some old PHP code that we have. Like it works. 
Um, we chose Node.js because we are a full stack company, really. So we have React apps on the front end, Node.js on the back end. So it means that we do have kind of less context switching to do. But um, ultimately, yeah, PHP works for you to go for PHP. Node.js works for you to go for Node.js. That's my take on the PHP matter. <laughs> Okay, if further questions are in this area, you can put them in me to Swaido and I'm going to ask them. I, I feel like a, a government person speaking to the party now. So um, the next one is, should a startup start uh, with a mon monolith architecture and just later on refactor it towards microservices uh, for its first project? Um, so I went to a really good talk recently actually on this matter, whether startups should go with monoliths or microservices. And here, there was a really good point. Um, that they, they've gone for microservices from the start, but they're planning to migrate into a monolith after. And his reasoning was really justified, I think, that when you start in a startup, you don't really know what your business is going to end up doing or where you're going to end up being. And the microservice architecture really allows you to adapt really quickly. Um, like If you have one giant monolith trying to rip pieces out and change it as your business direction changes, it's probably really difficult. But with microservices, you just delete one and change it. Um, yeah, and his take was that once they know in like two or three years' time kind of where their business sits, they'll start to re-couple sort of couple some of those pieces together. Um, so yeah, for me, I'd go with microservices from the start. It's quicker to change. So now I'll be cheating the system, asking my own question before the others that are here. My question was, uh, you were speaking of uh, so many ways here, but my question is, uh, how did you get to the process that the decision was made that uh, such a revolution is happening in your company overall? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so at Hollow Lectures, we have uh, something that we class as the foundation teams. So we have lots of pods who run sort of different parts of the business. Like we have people who are in charge of hotels, people in charge of car parks. Um, but we also have foundations teams whose only customer is the internal development teams at Hollow Lectures. So they're in charge of building the best tooling possible. Um, and their object, their metric, I suppose, is developer happiness, if you can really measure that. But it's, it's ultimately they're, they're in charge of listening to the, the what internal community and understanding what, where their pain points are and where they struggle. And then they, they go away and come up with a roadmap of how they're going to solve that problem. Um, so example, this whole project spun up from one of our engineers, one of our senior engineers who was listening to those problems of, I have to ship this. It takes two weeks for me to even get infrastructure configured. Mm -hmm. And he came back with this proposition. And we kind of now have data foundation teams who are in charge of uh, all of our data migrations um, and all that kind of stuff. So. So That's it's um, cool. rather an initiative coming up from the operations, the lower levels, rather than the executives? Um, yeah, it's a bit of both, yeah. I think. I think the engineers kind of were pushing that we, we have these problems, and then our sort of senior executive levels were listening to that and really, un really empowered us to push that. We, we're quite lucky at Holodexers that we're kind of given the, the chance to do that, um, and we're give our, they understand that we're, as developers, there's a trust there that we do the best job we can, and they'll allow us to do that in the way that we believe is best. Super. Then uh, I think this is a prelude for, for the question that's now into Slido. How much time did it cost you, also maybe finances, to build the architecture of the new system? Yeah, um, so we, we kind of dived head first. So we had a, a proposition to build a new way that we want to provide APIs to our external partners. Um, and we decided to go with GraphQL for that. So we have a GraphQL system. And that was our sort of first microservice that we had. Um, it was a pain, like it took a long time to really understand what we wanted to do. Um, we went with a, a system called Convox to start with, which wasn't great for us before we moved to Kubernetes. Um, and it was a pain, but we're, I think if we, we say that in a year we've gone from two weeks to five minutes, I think the, the benefits are quite clear at that. Um, the first three or four, five services that we tried to build were, were a real struggle, um, but we've got very good at it now, I think, and we're pretty happy with where we're at. So I think the, the time, in the first couple of months was quite a lot of people's time, but we've now saved more than that back. So do you use databases in Kubernetes is the next question? Um, I don't know. This is a good one to answer. I'm not in one of the core teams, so this is going to be a hard one for me to discuss. Um, I believe so. So we have, MySQL, we have a single MySQL instance that exists for, every, for each service. So if I have, I have 10 instances running, but I have one MySQL instance for that. Um, I believe they run in, in Kubernetes, but they don't shard. We don't use sharding yet. So. OK. Um, how do the front end uh, talks to the, those microservices? Do you have something like a gateway, or the communication is direct? Yeah, so we have a single API still. So our old monolith um, still exists. 
And our, our current roadmap is that we'll pull each part of that apart into microservices, and they will still, like, our front end will still go through the old API that it wanted to. Um, it means that we can, yeah, so might, we don't have front ends talking to multiple things. GraphQL really helps us with this as well. So our search API, which is a graph, GraphQL API I spoke about earlier, has lots of different connections for its resolvers to multiple different microservices, but ultimately I have, I go to one place to get that back. Thanks. How do you integrate the output of many microservices APIs? Do you think having a GraphQL gateway in front of it will work well? Yeah, so I suppose this kind of relates to the, the answer for the last question. Yeah, so we, yeah, we use GraphQL as our sort of front end API, I suppose, is the, the term that I'd use. But it, that's where we talk on our front end and everything comes together. Um, but back end APIs kind of can talk to, through GraphQL as well, like we have done that. Um, so I have a service that talks to a GraphQL API and gets data back. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've seen another PHP question. Could you share more on persistence patterns you're currently using? I'm reading the second one. I'm, I'm trying to. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, so in terms of persistence, I suppose people are talking about databases here. Is that right? I don't know whose question it was. But, um, yeah, so we have my, right now, um, it's where we're, our biggest pain point is, and it's the biggest roadmap for that, those foundations teams to work on, that we are struggling with scaling for MySQL instances. Um, so we're looking at better ways to do that. But yeah, right now we have a single MySQL instance for each team, and, each, and then their tables are aliased inside that database. Um, it, it works, but we, we try to keep our services as stateless as possible, so we, we push that to a global API, um, global database, sorry. So um, the, the next question comes to a very interesting part of what you've done, and um, the question is, uh, what technologies did you use in building your Swag bots and your awards? And I, I want to add about it, um, have you ever considered also open sourcing that and maybe sharing with other companies and stuff? Yeah, um, so we, Every, everything on HoloDex is JavaScript. Um, it, from now on, it always has been. We're trying to move a lot away from everything away that isn't to JavaScript. So all of our Slack integrations are, are done that way. We have a, a, I think it's done through a single service we have called the alerting service. So when an alert triggers, it all gets pushed um, to the alerting service, and that alerting service is responsible for talking to Slack. So we just communicate over the Slack APIs. Um, so yeah. I suppose that answers the questions. We just use JavaScript and Slack and the open source stuff. Um, it's something that I'm really keen on, and I'd really like us to, to start open sourcing a lot of the tech we've done. I think a lot of the um, spin-up processes that we've done for uh, Dockyard Create, for example, would be really beneficial to see um, what other people think of it and any improvements that they have as well. Um, right now, um, the problem is we don't want to open source it without being able to offer the time to maintain it. Um, we, we think that open sourcing something and leaving it to go stale is worse than open sourcing, not open sourcing it. So once I think right now we're, we're, we have a lot of movement in the teams and a lot of stuff going on, but it's definitely something on our roadmap for the future. Cool. Um, a question from Nikki. Do you use Monolith anywhere? Yeah, yeah, we have plenty. So we have a really old, as I said, we have the PHP Monolith that is still used a lot. So we have a lot of, we have a big German business and a big UK business. Right now the German business is sort of uh, further behind in the UK business, um, and that's still quite dependent on our old monoliths. Um, and our public API still runs through the old PHP monolith that we have. Um, it doesn't really cause us any problems other than sort of developer headaches, like there's a lot of code there, but um, it works, so we, we're happy to leave it where it is for now until there's a need to move it. Okay, and the last one would be, what's your take on the crusade against PHP, and uh, why do you think it's happening? <laughs> um, I think it's the hype, hype mentality. I think we're always drawn to the new, new shiny stuff. Um, PHP's had some, some bad things, I suppose, in its past, like older versions of PHP weren't great. I think PHP 5 and up are pretty stable. They've been pretty decent. PHP 7's definitely much better than its predecessors. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see any problems with it. Do you get uh, you know, some, some kind of worries why are we having a Google developer event and PHP is the most common and mentioned <laughs> technology? I get a little bit confused, but maybe that's what the community wants, especially taking into account that some of the questions are 11 times wiped. <laughs> Check whether a person can wipe this second. No, you can't, I tried. You, you can wipe <laughs> You can only do it once. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's, a, I don't know, it's, 
either many people are interested into that, maybe we should switch the, the community to PHP community. I don't know. Yeah, I think if you make people stand up and ask questions, you'll get very different questions. <laughs> Do you want to see the other question? The one, did you mention? Yeah, go ahead, bring them up. So, <laughs> <laughs> Does Brexit affect our business? Um, probably, it's probably gonna have some kind of impact on our business. Um, I didn't touch it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure what's gonna happen yet. I don't think anyone's really sure what's gonna happen with Brexit. So, um, we have a big European business anyway, so hopefully if uh, the UK business goes down here, we'll all just move over here. <laughs> okay, we're with you, we're supporting. Hopefully nothing will break, we'll see. Any further questions? Tom is going away, so please ask the, the questions now, uh, because otherwise we, you have to find him on Twitter and bother him about PHP later on. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, then is that thank you very much.